and grab it. Our world is immersed in a galaxy of data. Data that connects us, cures us, enables us to do more. Data that helps us innovate wherever imagination takes us. In 1969, Apollo 11's guidance computer was limited to 72 kilobytes as it traveled to the moon. Now, we have exponentially more power in the palm of our hands. This precious resource demands a trusted partner to harness and make every bit of it intuitively accessible at the speed of our ideas. The speed of SQL Server and Azure SQL, the latest evolution of data management's highly secure, supercharged platform, enabling you to break performance barriers and boost agility. Azure SQL Database's hyperscale capabilities allow you to auto-scale dynamically. Advanced data security keeps hazards at bay with a single click, while built-in cloud intelligence eliminates worry. Machine learning services enhance the value of your data by importing adjacent code to create models faster than ever. And with cross-platform solutions like Azure Arc, SQL Server and Azure SQL products can be leveraged virtually everywhere. Our team is motivated to consistently improve this new breed of database without disrupting the application of our existing technology. As many of the world's critical systems and most influential corporations deploy it, and agencies on our most important front lines depend on it, businesses like Balzano that leverage SQL Server big data clusters to help radiologists interpret medical images, or Zeiss that use Azure SQL Edge to constantly improve the manufacturing of optical lenses, and organizations that help us dream bigger, like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that built its ever-expanding database of 200 million galaxies and 260 million stars on SQL Server. Imagine what your data could dream up. Imagine unparalleled access to that next great innovation. Together, we can reach it at the speed of SQL Server in Azure SQL. Imagine a time. Well, as you can see from that video, SQL is everywhere you need it in new and exciting ways. Hello, I'm Bob Ward from Microsoft, live from the SQL Server and Azure SQL Conference. I want to stop for a second and pay special thanks. Shirley Brothers, Richard Campbell, the entire team here running this event, thank you wholeheartedly for giving us all the opportunity to be here in person and virtually a true hybrid event. And a special thanks to the Microsoft Learn team. We are broadcasting live on Learn TV. Thank you, Microsoft Learn, for partnering with us today. Many of you that are here in person or online, you're gonna have some questions. So I'm excited to tell you, immediately following this session, we're gonna have a live Q&A interviewed by the Learn team. I'm also very excited to be joined today during this session by my colleagues, Buck Woody and Anna Hoffman. Together, it's our intention during this session to explain to you all the exciting ways you can use SQL from edge to cloud. We also help hope to help explain to you when you might use these different ways of SQL Server and demonstrate ways of using SQL you've probably never seen before. Now to get started in this discussion, of SQL Edge to Cloud is probably no better way than do a little bit of a history. I've been here at Microsoft for 28 years, and in 1993, I was given these when I joined the company. And I said, what is this? It's not a save icon, by the way. Uh, and I, they said, this is SQL. So, you know, get going. Install this on a computer, because we're a desktop database company. I'm like a desktop database company, I came from Oracle and Linux and all these systems. I need to have something more than a desktop database. But think of the evolution of SQL Server over the years. Starting in, in versions like SQL 7.0, we became very popular on department servers, known for ease of use and great price performance. But in the 2000s, we elevated ourselves to the enterprise space, doing things like record-breaking TPC benchmarks, again, proving price performance was amazing against our competition. And as we move further down into the 2000s in the last decade, we did really crazy things with SQL. We put it in the cloud. We were the first relational database platforms of service in the cloud ever in the industry. And then we do something really crazy. We put SQL Server on Linux. And then SQL Server became known for not just a database, but a data platform with innovative technologies like machine learning and data virtualization. 
But all of it was based on a proven engine. Over time, we have demonstrated we have the best engine that powers all of this in the industry. So you start this journey of SQL Edge to Cloud. Let's do this. Let's have a visual representation of the assets of SQL Edge to Cloud. And then we intend in the rest of this session to kind of dive a little deeper into each of these and show you some really slick demonstrations. It all starts on the on-premises environment in the IoT Edge. Yes, SQL Server in an IoT device is on the edge. And then it transforms itself into your environments on-premises or in virtual machines with SQL Server 2019, whether it's running on Windows or Linux. And in the Linux space, this opens up new possibilities with things like containerized applications or running SQL Server on Kubernetes. Now you jump to the public cloud and you have things like Azure SQL, SQL Server running in Azure virtual machines, quick lift and shift operations, or even a full SQL Server platform as a service instance in Azure SQL managed instance. And then for new cloud-born applications, Azure SQL database with the latest innovations like hyperscale and serverless. Now recently, we've had customers tell us, I need a bridge to these worlds. So we've announced something called Azure Arc, bridging the worlds of the public cloud on Azure down to the on-premises world in your environment with SQL Server on Azure Arc enabled servers and Azure Arc enabled managed instance. Now you're looking at this today online or you're looking here in the room and you're going, I am blown away. How do I learn all of this stuff? I don't have the skills for this. You know you do. It's the same core engine that we use everywhere across the board. It's the same security, performance, and availability in the SQL engine that powers all of this. It's the same T-SQL language you know and love that exists from edge to cloud. So your skills in T-SQL apply everywhere. As a developer, all the modern languages are supported. You, we have the mantra of develop once, deploy anywhere, and that exists because it is the same core engine. And then finally, the tools you know and love, like Management Studio, or PowerShell, or Command Shells, and even new tool sets, like Azure Data Studio, or even in the Azure portal. Imagine using the Azure portal to manage everything you see on the slide. So let's do this. Let's take a journey into each of these a little bit, and then do some fun demonstrations. So it starts on the IoT edge. Consider a company like 3M in manufacturing. They have this problem. They want to put IoT technology in their manufacturing devices. In fact, what they love to do is do data processing and machine learned prediction on the devices themselves because they have so much telemetry they're streaming. In many cases, these devices are not even connected to the internet or semi-connected. So that's their challenge. How do I put intelligence in the IoT device versus just a streaming device? Along comes Azure SQL Edge, a SQL Server engine with a small footprint that has things like time series built in, streaming, and even machine learning built and integrated with the engine in a containerized application. Or native movement to Azure. So if you do have results from these devices when you're connected, you can intelligently move those and do a data intelligence and business intelligence in the cloud. But we noticed when we were doing this a project that we, we were running through for SQL Edge, most of these IoT devices are running on ARM devices, some on Intel, mostly on ARM. Yes, SQL Server in a 500 megabyte footprint runs on an IoT ARM device. I never thought I'd see the day when SQL Server runs on a Raspberry Pi. But guess what? It's the SQL Server engine. Column store indexes exist in this engine. All the security features of SQL Server exist on this engine. And the idea that you could actually build an application now that could run on the edge or that can actually run in SQL Server, or run in Azure SQL, develop what's deploy anywhere, is the promise of what we do with Azure SQL Edge, and 3M, again, being a great example of a company that has pushed down the ability to do prediction of machine failures in their environment by using the power of SQL Server. Now we flip the model now a little bit to SQL 19, our latest version of SQL Server re-released at the end of 19, I spent a lot of time in that calendar year. I keep telling everybody last year, but really that was actually a couple of years ago, right? And in that year, I spent the entire year on the journey talking to customers about this slide. Customers called this the camera slide. Why is that? Because everybody wanna take a picture of it. It's a visual representation of what we've delivered in the product, the hero features, the hero capabilities of SQL 19. You start in that top left-hand corner, what is that? Can SQL Server be an engine that powers your ability to query data and all of those icons, including Hadoop, and never move the data. That's exactly what data virtualization is. Or you'd like to spin up your own data lake with a big data cluster. 
including capabilities like machine learning in the environment itself. Or think about in the middle there. Imagine a world where you take a database backup on Linux and you restore it on the IoT edge or you store it in the cloud or you store it on containers or in Windows and it's the same. The engine compatibility is the same across these platforms and it is truly gives you the power now to build your applications or deploy SQL and avoid a lot of translation or migration scenarios. Now, we need machine learning, and you're going to see some great demonstrations today of that. So we have an extensibility platform with the database itself. You can run your machine learning models with R and Python, and that type of thing exists today, by the way, not just on the IoT Edge, but in SQL Server and even in the cloud with Azure SQL Managed Instance. Look across the top right here, I remember in 2019, a famous quote from my colleague Travis Wright is like, Bob, that's not your grandpa's SQL Server anymore. I was worried he was referring to me with the grandpa comment, but actually I don't think that was the case. But then my, my friend Pedro Lopes said, Travis is a little bit right, but what's really true is the bottom here. It's the innovations in performance, security, and availability. And it all starts with intelligent query processing. How would you love to be able to take your app, make no code changes, and get faster? That's exactly what Bank et al. did. Bank et al. upgraded to SQL 19 in a test environment and saw a 90% increase in performance with no changes to their code. And they called us and said, what did you do? <laughs> and we said, we improved the query processor to adapt to your workload and make things run faster. And that technology exists in the cloud, also in SQL Server. But you want to make sure you're secure and compliant. We introduced technologies like always encrypted with secure enclaves and data for classifications to help you with things like GDPR compliance. And then finally, a truly amazing story called accelerated database recovery that was born in the cloud first, but also now lived in SQL Server, and basically, it basically saves the world from long recovery problems. How would you like to be in scenarios now where long recovery issues, long rollbacks do not bring down your business? That's the power of accelerated database recovery. You look in totality, what I've shown you on the screen right here, this is not just an engine anymore. It's powered by a core engine, but it is truly a data platform. And what better way to learn about what this platform can do than from a data scientist? So I'd like to bring Buck Woody on stage. Buck, how are you doing? I'm doing great, and I'm so thrilled to be here. This hybrid event, Bob, don't go anywhere. I need oh. you. I, I've got some cool stuff I want to show Oh, okay. Some cool stuff. We're going to do the thing, but i got to show you. We're going to do the thing. So, it's great to be here in person. I'm wearing clothes again. That's awesome. <laughs> it's good to see you uh, in person, and those of you online, thrilled to have you here as well. Uh, I was, you know, we're here at Disney. Right, we're right here we next are. to Disney. We we're are. at the Swan yeah. and Dolphin Hotel, right next to Disney. So I know you told me that we were supposed to do some business meetings, but I went out yesterday and I was doing this cool thing. I took this cool picture. You like it? You like the picture I got there? Sure. Do, do you get it? Uh, yeah. No. Wood, Woody and Buzz. Oh my. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, anyway, uh, I, you know, what I thought. I thought. You know what I should probably do? I should probably go out and use our Azure Cognitive Services on this picture. And let me tell you what this is. So we've got a bunch of brainiacs from the planet Tron up in Microsoft Research. And they write all these cool algorithms for vision. They've got uh, things for uh, text. They've got things for speech. They've everything you can possibly imagine. And then what they do is you can send it stuff as an API call. Let me show you how that works. So I sent my picture, my cool picture there. I actually sent that up to the cloud. And I told it, can you predict what that is? And look, it found my face. It knows I'm a person. Well, it's pretty certain I'm a person. It knows there's a cartoon here. And it even got my age correctly. It guessed my age from a photo. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? Yeah, but Buck, that's that's really cool. Buck, this is a sequel, a sequel keynote. Oh, oh, the sequel part. Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, I should probably show you some code, I guess. You want to see some code? All right, I'll tell you what. Why don't we do this? Uh, you know, a lot of people know we have machine learning services built right into SQL Server. You can write R, Python, Java, even other languages. You know that that's in there. Yeah. So data scientists can actually write their code, create models, and score them or get the prediction back. You could do that. But you got to learn math and statistics and coding and Python and R and all that. And I guess some people really enjoy that. But other people are more involved just getting their work done every day. So they asked me, could you take that same thing you just did, like with that picture up to the Azure Cognitive Services, do no machine learning, but make a call out of my database up to that, get the answer and put it back in my database. 
So you don't have to be a data scientist, but you can get the same predictions. Let's take a look. What I've got here is I've got a database called Analysis, and I'm gonna look at my product reviews. And you can see here, there's a, there's a review here that says works fine for a certain product number, easy to install, some reviews talk about not fitting wall plates, blah, blah, blah. All right, so here's what I did. I used the machine learning services, that's in SQL Server, but I didn't write machine learning. I just called Python, I set up my keys and my contact up in cognitive services, and I said, take a look at this text and tell me if they think this is a good product or not. Because I wanna get my sentiment and maybe we make the product better, maybe we change something, maybe we make it cheaper, whatever we happen to do. So all I do is literally send that text up there with the same select statement. And if you can see here, it says this, uh, overall sentiment, 75%. Now that's kind of interesting because it knew that that sentence had, oh, works great, but some people complain. So what does that mean? So it literally tore apart the sentence, gave me a complete score, just like you would tell me, yeah, they kind of liked it. But then it also tore apart each sentence and told me that sentence was positive, that sentence was negative. And it even returns how confident it is in that particular prediction. So I can now do machine learning in SQL, in a secure environment, without being a data scientist. I think you could even do this, Bob. <laughs> Maybe, I know SQL, <laughs> does that work? It sounds like, Buck, what you're telling me now that is, we brought the power of machine learning down close to the database, so I can develop models all I want, even outside that scenario, but I can bring my models into SQL Server because it's close to the data. That is correct. And then SQL Server's optimized to understand how to work with these machine learning models together, so it's highly performant as well, I would guess, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, and awesome. the data is secure, it stays right there, I can version them and everything else, or as we pointed out, you can call out and use somebody else's work, and as you know, I'm very good at using other people's work. Well, a scary summary for that demonstration might be that I could be Buck Woody. You could be Buck Woody. Yeah, that would be scary. Enjoy. Buck, thank you so much. Thanks for your demonstration. I appreciate that. So we're on this journey, Edge to Cloud, right? We talked about IoT Edge, SQL Server. Now we talked about SQL 19, the power of SQL as a data platform. What about SQL Server containers? That's a lot of people ask me about containers, why I should consider them. In fact, let me tell you an interesting story. When you think about portability of SQL Server, at this event two years ago, I was talking about SQL Server containers and somebody from the back of the audience had a MacBook and I'm using Windows 10 showing containers with Docker containers. <clears throat> and this person said, uh, I got a question. I'm like, yeah, what's your question? He goes like, I'm not feeling the Mac love here. Like I got a MacBook and you've been talking about Windows and I'm a Mac developer, you know, Linux, all that kind of stuff. You're talking about Linux containers, show me the love. And I'm like, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> and I made this statement without actually knowing if it was gonna be true or not. I said, I'm gonna give you the SQL Server Mac challenge. I will tell you that in five minutes on your MacBook, you can deploy SQL Server, deploy tools, connect to that SQL Server and never use Windows. And they're like, yeah, right. I'm like, hey, try it. And by the way, if I'm wrong, you can get on Twitter. You've heard of like the Twitter thing. You get on Twitter and say I was wrong. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I said this, I went back to my hotel room going, man, was I right about that? So I started to get up my machine uh, with somebody else's MacBook to test it all out. And so the next day on Twitter, this person said, Bob Ward gave me the SQL Server Mac challenge and he was wrong. And I was like, oh man, I've said this in front of hundreds of people, I'm terrible. He said I could do it in five minutes and I did it in three minutes. Now, what did he do? This person went and deployed a SQL Server Linux container because MacBooks support containers. And this person installed Azure Data Studio and there's a native Mac version of that. This is a story of portability. It's the same SQL Server engine you can use on Mac, Linux, Windows, you name it. Anywhere a container can run, it can run it. Now it's very lightweight. Today, look at this diagram right here. Imagine that square below was a virtual machine. Here's a myth, containers, replace virtual machines, not true. Containers complement virtual machines. In fact, for SQL Server on Linux, this is how you run multiple instances of SQL Server. You run multiple containers inside a VM environment because you don't need a dedicated VM just to run SQL Server. Now it's consistent because it's the same SQL Server image you know and love. And imagine a world now where you could get rid of your development servers. I'm sorry for developers online or on the phone, but DBAs don't like you. 
because you come onto a shared development server they're managing and you mess it up all the time. So instead of doing that, why don't you give your developers a specific version of SQL Server down to the cumulative update level and customize that image along with scripts and tools, package it together and tell a developer, go write your code against that. Let's all write against the same configuration of SQL, the same cumulative updates together, no more shared development servers. And then one of the hero stories of containers is what I call the switch method to patch SQL. <clears throat> you don't patch containers, you switch containers. Imagine a world where a SQL server container, like on the screen here that's grayed out, <clears throat> was running SQL 19 CU something. And you want to go to the next CU. Well, you don't patch the current container. You just spin up a new container with the right CU you want. You point to the same set of system user databases, and within seconds, you have patched SQL Server. And you're saying to yourself, well, that doesn't sound that exciting. What if you need to roll back? You just switch back to the old one, and you're ready to go. So containerization for SQL Server is an amazing story, especially when you start combining it with the power of Kubernetes, an orchestrated way to run production containers. And if you'd like to consider how containers can help DevOps when you get this deck, or you can go and do a search for last year's build conference in 2020, I did a, a video, a demonstration of showing how to combine Azure DevOps and use containers in a declarative way with GitHub. So now we've talked about Edge. We talked about 19, we talked about containers. What about this Azure SQL thing? Why do we call it Azure SQL? This is a portfolio of SQL Server in the cloud, all the way from infrastructure as a service for SQL servers in VM. You're thinking about today, here online, here in this room, I need to get to the cloud fast. How do I do it? This is the fastest way. Think about taking an entire virtual machine image and just lifting and shifting this inside Azure and then optimizing from there. <clears throat> now, it could be, though, that you'd like this platform as a service concept. In fact, you would like to not have to worry about availability groups anymore. Wouldn't that be a nice story? But you need the power of the complete SQL instance. So you could go to Azure SQL Managed Instance if you'd like to do that. And that's what we provide to you as part of that platform as a service story. Or your company right now is thinking about, we're going to build a new app, a cloud-born application. So what are, what are your options or what you consider? Consider Azure SQL Database, where you're going to have a containerized database, but you're going to light up new innovations in the cloud with things like hyperscale and serverless technologies. This is the suite of Azure SQL. You have more control on the left-hand side, you have less control on the right-hand side, but you get more platforms of service, more management capabilities as you move to the right-hand side. But again, remember our story from the beginning. It's the same core engine running this technology. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of quickly compare some of the huge benefits of SQL Server versus PaaS. My colleague Anna Hoffman likes to summarize it this way. You can do a lot of this stuff in SQL Server, but you just got to configure it and you got to manage it and monitor it. But in PaaS, we try to do as much as we can to automate things to take away the burden of certain things. Like consider the continuity and high availability and backup story. How would you like if we would put together for you an automated backup strategy where we back up everything automatically behind the scenes, we make it triple redundant, even geo redundant across regions across the world, and then you keep backups around for 10 years and restore any time you want. How would you like that kind of story? How would you like to build your own backup system doing that? Well, we manage it for you. I've seen customers try to go build those kind of same systems and it works for them. And then somebody leaves the company and they haven't documented what they did. So somebody tries to inherit what they did. Does this sound familiar? And how do I go manage and put that together? Well, guess what? We got your back. We're the ones doing this. And we power it with a service level agreement where we put our money where our mouth is. Or even geo-replication. I'd like to quickly spin up in the ability to replicate my current Azure SQL deployment around the world. We have that with things like geo-replication and auto failover groups. But the story doesn't stop there. You need to scale. You need to do it in an automated way. <clears throat> You'd like to build an application that we help you decide how to scale your cores as your worker loads increase versus you having to decide how many cores to pick. That is the promise of serverless technology in Azure SQL Database. What about advanced security? How would you like to be able to have uh, the cloud notify you when there's a SQL injection attack in your environment? <clears throat> or how would you like us to use best practices from the industry to do vulnerability assessments to see whether you might be subjected to problems in your environment? That is what Azure Defender for SQL is all about, and that exists today across our Azure suite. What about versionless? Wouldn't it be nice to get rid of patching? Like, wouldn't you like to free yourself? 
I was with a customer back before this entire pandemic hit in North Carolina, and we were having dinner together. We're a nice dinner. We're talking about SQL and all innovations. And they said, we got to go. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. We're having fun here. Where are you leaving? Like, oh, we got to go do our patching. They were going to go spend all night in their environment patching operating systems and patching SQL servers and make sure it all worked. And they said, I kind of heard that Azure thing might kind of help us here. And I explained to them the concept of versionless before they left. And they said, how do you come back and tell us this story? I did it virtually to tell them the story right after that, but they were sold. <clears throat> or how about the power of this? Just today, we announced a new functionality called query hints, where you can go to the query store and use kind of like on plan guides, force a query in the query store to a different plan, a different performance capability. And we just announced that's for Azure SQL. So versionless gives you the latest and greatest technologies in the SQL server engine. And then finally, built-in monitoring. You go and look at Azure SQL today and you don't know if you've got the monitoring tools you need, we have them. Plus we have new technology called SQL Insights. How about a Perfmod-like experience across all your Azure SQL assets? And then how about built-in intelligence? If today developers are complaining that they don't know how to build indexes, we have automatic tuning for indexes in Azure SQL database. Now let's talk a little bit about additions for Azure SQL. You're having to make some choices and you're not sure what you get. You're used to buying enterprise edition, standard edition, developer edition, and you're quite, quite sure whether we have what you need. <clears throat> so in Azure SQL database and in managed instance, you have a choice called general purpose. These are all declarative statements, by the way. You're not installing anything. You're just declaring what you need. And so you decide that for your workload, you just need the most standard basic flavor of Azure SQL. That's why it's called general purpose. <clears throat> We put things in Azure storage. Think in terms of a failover cluster instance. Who here, raise your hand if you've ever had to deploy or manage a failover cluster instance. Okay, people in the back of the room are like, yes, sorry, me. <laughs> people online, people online are like, me, I've done it. They're waving their hands like this now, right? How would you like it if you just declared, I want a general purpose service tier, and we just did that for you? We use the power of Azure storage to make your shared storage capabilities. We integrate ourselves with the service fabric for failover decisions, and we just automatically fail you, fail you over in an instance-like fashion. But here's another power. You don't have to build a listener. It's all built in to this environment. Now you're gonna get general IO performance because we're using Azure storage, but it is gonna light up some capabilities you get nowhere else, and that is serverless. And let's pause for a second and talk about that. What is serverless like? Why did I even think about that? You decide in your application with SQL Server, but you decide to go to the cloud. So you're paying a subscription model for what you're using for SQL. But you know that in certain points of time, maybe like a constant time during the evening, you don't even use a thing. So you're like, look, I don't want to pay Microsoft when I don't use this. Can't you help me? So we have something called auto pause and serverless. You start coming along, use your database, and then at one in the morning, nobody touches it. And then it picks back up again at say four in the morning. During that three hour window, you're not billed for any compute time to be used. We pause your SQL server to make that successful. And you get a primary replica, just like a failover cluster instance. So then you can kind of up your game. You're going to pay a little bit more, but you're going to up your game because you need business critical needs. We are going to store your databases on local storage. And then I'm going to show you in a second here, we're going to build an amazing architecture using availability groups. So we're going to give you the highest redundancy recovery that you need. But we're also going to give you the lowest latency. So if you're a latency sensitive IO application, you got to take a look at business critical. That's why it says IOPS plus plus. Anna Hoffman calls this the Yelp style of comparing these choices. And if you need MMLTP, Hecaton technology, this is where you're going to land as well. Now notice the P's and the S's and the R's. P is for your primary replica. The S's are for your secondary replicas and R is for a read replica. We'll show you in a second from an architecture point of view how we weave these technologies together. Finally, in Azure SQL database, we've unlocked incredible innovation called hyperscale. Let's say today you have a 70 terabyte database and you need read scale with it. And you're like, you guys cannot build a compute in a VM that matches my needs. And like, no, we can't. And it's called hyperscale. What we've done is built a tiered architecture of caching so that you can take an extremely large database and even though the buffer pool will not match that, we cache things in certain layers so that we meet your performance needs. And we take the loggings and decouple it from the actual computer, the engine, 
to feed changes into these caches and to feed changes into possible replicas. So look at the diagram now below. There are four R's. What are the R's? That's where you get read scale. It's an amazing set of technologies that you can use. In fact, if you think about companies that are out there today, I'll start from right to left. ClearScale is a company that told us exactly that. I am gonna grow my database needs and you gotta scale with me for my read workload. How do I do that? We said, okay, we'll set up your database and maybe pick one read replica, which they did. And then they started growing. It was like, dynamically just add another. And yes, that's true, dynamically add another and you just scale with it, up to four replicas. Here's the other cool story that we told ClearSale because they had 70 you know, terabytes of data. They're like, hey, we're kind of worried about backup here. I mean, that's a lot of data to back up. How are you gonna do that? Because of the fact that we put your data on Azure storage, we can use snapshot backup technology to totally make the application oblivious we're doing backups. And to even make it even more interesting, clear sales like, how am I gonna do a point in time restore of 70 terabytes? Isn't that gonna take days? Uh, minutes. Because we're using snapshots, we can go behind the scenes and restore. In fact, I've seen demonstrated before, a 40 terabyte database restored in seven minutes. That is with the power of something like hyperscale. AccuWeather, another good example of a company that needed just a database. They're like, look, we really can't afford to manage these SQL servers any anymore, but as it turns out, we really just need the database part of all of this. And so they made a migration to move several of their databases into just Azure database. H&R Block is even a cooler story. It's the story of the lift and shift we talked about. They said, we got to get to the cloud fast. So some of our VMs have older SQL servers. We want to put those in the cloud very quickly. We said, okay, go to VM. And then they were looking at VM and they said like, well, that managed instance thing sounds cool. I'd love to have that auto backup story. How do I do that? And so they put some of their other databases in managed instance. It's a great example of companies that are not just choosing one Azure SQL option versus the other. They're picking all three options to meet the needs of where they are in their journey to the cloud. So you may ask yourself as well, this sounds interesting from an engine perspective. I see the value of what you're talking about, but is there more? Yes, there's more. This is the value of the cloud. Azure Defender, I mentioned a little bit briefly already, the fact that you just declare, I want Azure Defender. And by the way, that technology exists across all Azure resources, but specifically for SQL Server, we've demonstrated before the ability to proactively tell you and alert you to things like injection attacks or or suspicious activities to try to intrude and, and get into your database. How about if somebody's trying to maliciously log in to your Azure cloud resources and you want to know about it, we can detect that with machine learning technology. We just recently announced at Microsoft Build an exciting new technology called Azure SQL Database Leisure. How would you like to bring blockchain technology down inside the SQL engine in a centralized fashion? Because today maybe the decentralized way of blockchain is not meeting your needs. That is Azure SQL Database Ledger. Check that out. That's just announced at the Microsoft Build Conference. I'm really excited to see where that lands for us for new applications that need that immutable blockchain type technology. And then I kind of briefly mentioned before, we announced preview for this early in the spring. I would love a Perfmon experience across like all my Azure SQL assets. I'd like to see visualizations across virtual machine, managed instance, databases, SQL server, availability groups, replicas. And by the way, I would love it if you build it in such a way that I could customize it and consume it outside your portal. That's what SQL Insights is all about, using the power of technologies like Telegraph and Grafana in a monitoring machine to monitor your assets and give you information outside that SQL environment. And then finally, we talked about intelligent performance. I just mentioned an example of query hints to you already that we just announced today, and definitely take a chance to check out automatic tuning with indexes or the whole suite of intelligent query processing. It is our intention to make SQL Server an intelligent engine continually in the cloud and also land that in SQL Server. Well, hey, I think there's any better way to kind of think about what Azure SQL Databases is from a new application point of view than to bring on stage the host of Data Exposed, <laughs> Anna Hoffman. Anna, come join us on stage. Thanks so much, Bob. I'm excited to be here. Hey, folks. Um, so for this demo, let me just get this set up. Uh, but Bob, I don't know if you know this, but I actually like to go for a run every morning. Let me just close some of Buck and Woody tabs. Yeah, I think you passed me when I was walking yesterday morning. Yes. <laughs> um, so I like to go for a run every morning and especially here at Disney, uh, I've been logging those runs in an application. Now this is a simple fitness tracking application. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this type of application. 
So I'm going to go ahead and log into this application. And what you can see is just some various runs from my time here at Disney. Now I can even go ahead and start a new workout. And I want to be clear that while I'm running or doing my workout actively, we're not sending any data anywhere. This is going to help me in conserving my battery. However, when I end my workout, what we're going to do is we're going to send that data to Azure to be stored and processed. So if I hop over to the Azure portal, uh, what you're going to see here is a hyperscale database like Bob has talked about. This database is currently 13 terabytes in size and it can grow as needed. So this is supporting my production application with all its users and all their information. Now, part of the processing that we wanted to do for users is around when the workout actually ended. I was guilty, as well as many of our users, of forgetting to click the end workout when I was done with a run. So what we've done is we've added some processing to help, to help predict when the workout is run. As a simple example, I'm just going to manually update one of my runs from yesterday. And hopefully that, that runs. We can make sure we're connected. Oh, man. OK. That's unfortunate. OK, so in theory, we would, <laughs> sorry. Um, let me see. This is unfortunate. Uh, my IP address changed when I moved rooms, so I no longer have access to this database. But when we update our application or update our, our, our items, we only want to update the things that have changed in our application. Now, with Azure SQL, we're leveraging the same SQL engine, so this allows us to take advantage of things like change tracking. Now, change tracking is going to allow me to basically create a change table and track changes from a specific version. So this means I can then construct an API which is going to return JSON and return only the information I need. Here you can see I can specify that JSON query and the information that I want returned. Now this is part of the beauty is that I actually get to specify how I want that JSON returned. Um, so this is going to help me in implementing in my application. As a simple example to see of how this might work, we can go into a tool called Insomnia and track some of our changes. So for example, if I simply select a version, so I can go back to 159 and a user ID, I can see the specific changes and only those changes that have happened. For example, an update or an insert. This means I'm not having to pull all of the data to and from my phone application. And in a time where phone battery is everything is very important. So with this simple exercise, you've seen how Azure SQL database and in this case, the hyperscale service tier is going to allow you to take advantage of all the Azure SQL database features and functionality while getting some of the extra benefits like limitless storage with a 13 terabyte database, as well as some added benefits around read scale and size of data operations. Now, this is great for production, but I'm also working on some updates to my application. For example, if I go over to VS Code, um, what I'm actually doing is I'm going to go ahead and push up some changes to GitHub. This will kick off a GitHub action as well as a build. So while that's building, I can show you what I pushed up. So we saw earlier here I have this, this stored procedure, but what I want to do is start adding temperature to my data collection. This way I think maybe we can find some correlations or analysis around the humidity, the temperature, and how that affects my workouts. So what I've done is I simply had to add two scripts. One script, which is going to add the temperature column to my data table, and another script to update that stored procedure to also return the temperature as a result. So we already pushed that up to GitHub. So what I can do is I can come in to GitHub and I can see, one, that I've gone ahead earlier and configured my development environment. So you can see scripts one, two, and three were run on my Azure SQL database. And if I go into GitHub Actions, I can see this new GitHub Action has kicked off. And what we're doing is we're running a build and we're going to go apply the extra scripts on our database, which have not been run yet. Now, while this is running, it takes just a few minutes, I wanted to show you what database I'm using. Believe it or not, I'm not actually going to use that 13 terabyte copy of that hyperscale database for my development workloads. However, I need a database that's going to contain the same features and functionality of that hyperscale database. 
So for this, I'm using a serverless database. Serverless is going to be great because I'm not using this application all the time. I'm not developing or working on this application all the, all the time. So what I can do is do things like set an auto pause delay of one hour. So after one hour of inactivity, we're actually going to pause the database. And during that time, I'll only be billed for storage. This is really going to help me keep my dev costs low. Now, if I take a look at the metrics, what you're going to see is over time, I'm actually only being billed for what I actually use from a CPU or memory perspective. This means if I'm not using the database, I'm not being billed for CPU. So this is huge cost savings. Now, finally, if we go back to GitHub Actions, we can see that the build has completed and scripts four and five have been added. So with tools like serverless databases and GitHub Actions, we can really increase the performance and efficiency and lower costs of our development workloads. So overall, what I hope you've seen today is how Satya says that Azure is the world's database, or sorry, the world's computer, but we think SQL is the world's database. Thank you. Awesome. You know, Anna, what I love about your demonstration is the fact that you showed a production database with like 13 terabytes in hyperscale that provide read scale for your application needs, but then you shifted and showed me how you'd use the copy of the database in a serverless environment to save you money while you're developing and integrated with technologies like GitHub in a true DevOps fashion. That's just, that's not SQL Server and diskettes anymore, folks. That is a true modern way to build and run SQL Server. Okay, so today in this room, today live, you're thinking to yourself, I do run SQL Server today, and I'm thinking about migration, but I really don't even know where to start. Look at the top right-hand corner of this slide. First of all, the aka.ms data migration site is absolutely your one-stop hub to learn how to migrate. It includes every possible data source you can imagine for SQL and every possible target you might want to migrate to. But here's some tips and here's a vision of where we're headed to help you make it easier to migrate SQL Server. First of all, Azure Migrate can be used today as a one-stop place to discover and assess your SQL assets. We announced a preview this spring at Ignite, the ability to run something called an Azure Migrate VMware appliance. Imagine taking technology in your environment now and discovering and assessing thousands of SQL servers, finding out exactly what they actually look like, getting an inventory of those in Azure Migrate, but then also monitoring the performance of your workload in these machines and giving you estimations of cost, and estimations of what is the right deployment method you should be using with possible migration blockers. It is our intention to extend that technology to everywhere SQL Server runs today, whether that be bare metal servers, Hyper-V, Azure VM, or even other cloud environments. Now, we've also announced recently a preview of an inline experience with Azure Data Studio. So let's say you have a SQL server today that you just know you're going to migrate. I just want to go do it. And I'd like to do that in an online fashion. You can do that inside a wizard experience with Azure Data Studio, which is really powerful because it allows you to kind of query both environments within the same tool as you're going through the migration experience. We've had customers tell us that migration is great. I love the tools you're providing. I got to do that online. I need almost zero downtime for this experience. We have the tools you need. Azure Database Migration Service or the new Log Replay Service can allow you to use log shipping technologies behind the scenes to migrate your SQL Server in a continuous fashion and then cut over and make the necessary application changes to direct your app to the new Azure SQL Managed Instance or VM environment. So if you think about the journey we've made, notice the little dots at the bottom of the screen, that's what we call breadcrumbs. We are now at the very last phase of that journey because we've talked about the Edge, 19, Linux containers, and the public cloud of Azure SQL. But I mentioned to you, we needed a way to connect these worlds. Customers told us, like Ford, we need a way to take the power of Azure and run it in our environment. Can you do that? Can you give us Azure services? Can you connect us either in a direct way or in a semi-connected way to Azure so that we could view our Azure assets in one way? We could actually get billed for SQL Server in a way like Azure bills us and see that billing in the cloud. Or can you put intelligence of Azure in our environment? In fact, is it possible for you to take the power of Azure SQL managed instance auto backups, auto DR, evergreen version of the SQL Server, 
and I can run it in my data center, that's what Azure Arc is all about. Versionless, scale, and unified management. Azure Arc enabled SQL Managed Instance and Azure Arc Postgres are in preview today. We'll continue to iterate on those technologies in this calendar year. We are using the power of Kubernetes, any Kubernetes that you want to put on in your environment to do this technology. So that's a way of bridging these technologies. But don't forget, it's the same SQL Server engine we're deploying everywhere. Now, this particular slide is not meant for you to read <laughs> here in this presentation. Where are all the check marks, Bob? I don't get it, right? What we did is we sat back and said, for all these edge to cloud scenarios, what should you use during certain situations? What does it make sense to use edge? What does it make sense to use Azure SQL Managed Instance? What about containers? So we lined up some scenarios on the left-hand side and we lined up our products on the right-hand side. A little bit of work in progress. Maybe we'll just write a paper on it someday. Maybe we'll write a tool on it someday. Here's the interesting part. You're going to go look at something like this later when you get this deck. And you're going to go, you know what? I don't just need one of these. I need like many of these. Most of our customers today are not making one choice. They're making a choice in multiple scenarios because today's modern applications require multiple scenarios. But in your mind, you got to go back to think the same T-SQL language, the same engine for security, performance, and availability. What about the future? Where are we heading? That's pretty interesting, Bob, what we're doing today. It is our intention to unify SQL across your environment and the cloud. You're going to continue to see us iterate like on that ARC story. How do we bring together the power of Azure and let you control where SQL runs? Run it in the public cloud, run it in your environment. And so you'll continue to see us innovate in this space. You saw a great example of Anna showing you a modern developer experience with Azure SQL database. We will make this even better. We intend to solve new development problems and invest more in languages, things like JSON, Graph, and IoT technologies, all using the power of SQL. And then you saw a demonstration we, we talked about several times about hyperscale and serverless. We didn't even mention elastic pools. In the Azure database world, we want to double down on that technology. Imagine a world where you just say, I want a database. That's all I want. Give me a database. And we just did all this behind the scenes. We made it serverless, made it scale, and it just works for you. And the security is still a critical part. SQL Server continues to be the least vulnerable database on the planet 10 years running. So we always will invest in this space. We're going to double down on things like enclaves with always encrypted technology. We want to integrate with things like Azure Purview to help you do least privileged type access to SQL Server. And then you, we talked about already the idea of bringing blockchain to the power of SQL with something like Ledger. And so think about this bottom comment down here. Not the engine, but a modern data platform on premises in the cloud. So we continue to increase our investment in intelligence and in things like virtualization, analytics, and machine learning. All of this represent the future is what we're doing in Azure SQL Edge to Cloud. Now, why not provide you some resources? I'll leave this up here for a second because I have a few minutes just left here to talk about this because we always also want to give time for great opportunities for our interview, but let's talk about them some. You want to learn more. First of all, at the top right-hand corner, and we'll leave this up for you, those who are online and here in this room, this is where the deck is. I'm an open source presenter. Have you ever heard that term before, open source presenter? <laughs> so take this deck and use it in your own organization. Go teach your companies what is possible for SQL Edge to Cloud. So the deck is already there. Many of the demonstrations that we show you are in this location. And Anna's a code that she showed you, the entire code example is on GitHub in that location. Now let's say you want to get started with Azure SQL Edge. The link at the very top is a way to quickly get started. Many people ask me, I need to build some code pretty quickly to kind of play around with this. Here's a quick tip. Did you know that you can go build an IoT Edge application with SQL in Azure VM? You can simulate what it's like to have like a Raspberry Pi device, but get the developer experience yourself all using Azure technologies. Now you may be asking yourself, I got to do a container and I don't even know how to do this. So we have many training documents for you, but Azure AKMS SQL containers is an easy way to get started to build them. The other thing you're trying to do is you're trying to find out where are the right training from my organization? I guess what? Don't hire a training organization anymore. Or if you are a training organization, go to AKMS SQL workshops. This is a complete set of workshops across everything we've talked about today, but not built by a third party company, built by us in the engineering team. We want to show you all the right things from our perspective of how to learn these products. Now, you also have heard about Azure SQL this week already, and you heard me talk about it today. And you're thinking to yourself, Bob, 
I've seen your SQL 19 workshop, and it's pretty easy to take SQL 19 on my laptop and go do it for free. But how would you like to do this for free with Azure? Go to Azure SQL Fundamentals. You can use the Microsoft Learning Path, our partners again from the Learn team, and you get a free Azure Sandbox to train completely on Azure SQL Database. There is a certification called DP300 from Microsoft for relational databases in the cloud. It was not Anna and I's intention for this to be directly a call out with that certification. We have had dozens, no, maybe even hundreds of people tell us, I took your training and I passed the certification. If you're trying to find a way to get experience in the cloud, sometimes certifications are a way to talk to your company or other companies about how to do that. Now you want to make sure you know how to migrate. We already mentioned this once, but let's reinforce it again. Your company's thinking about migration. You don't know where to start. Start with the data migration hub. We continually, and we've, I've seen the emails within our company on this, we innovate and integrate and update that all the time to make sure you have the latest and greatest or all the processes and the tools you need. Now you want to keep up to date with what's going on. I mean, I threw a lot of stuff at you today. For those folks online, you're like, I can't keep up with y'all. You innovate so fast for us, what are we going to do? Well, guess what? Follow at Azure SQL handle on Twitter. Marisa Brazil, who happens to be in the back of this room, she's like behind the scenes, the power of what we do. I've never seen anybody more devoted to keeping people up to date using that. But maybe you like videos, you like YouTube. You're like, you know what, I kind of like to watch some bite design videos. Look at our YouTube channel. It started with this crazy journey last summer with some 60 plus videos about Azure SQL. It has exploded so fast. How would you like to see interviews almost on a weekly basis with members of the SQL team hosted by Anna Hoffman, where she interviews them and they do demonstrations and show you about the latest visions of T-SQL Server at Azure SQL. That is what we call our Azure SQL Digital Confident on YouTube. And also it's part of our Data Expose show. In fact, if I think correctly, I think there's going to be a Data Expose show tomorrow live from this conference somewhere. I may have to pop in and kind of like video bomb that thing, right, when it's going on. You know, in SQL Server team and the Azure SQL team, we actually write some books. Can you believe that? You want to go learn more about our technologies in a book way? You can read these books on Linux, SQL 19, Azure SQL, and even a really great book by several members of our team about how to build new applications with Azure SQL. I can't believe I'm even actually saying this. I, taught, I started this entire session today by thanking Shirley, by thanking Richard, by thanking members of the team for organizing this event as an in-person hybrid event. Well, get ready. In December in Las Vegas, we are back to full bore with SQL Server, Azure SQL Conference, and Dev Intersection. And you can bet that the SQL Server team is going to be there in force. And I'm sure there's going to be some incredible new and exciting technologies. So let's review what we started today. We started today with a vision from a video. And then I told you this incredible story about the save button that I received back in 1993. And that transformed into a vision and a reality of SQL Server running on Raspberry Pis, on SQL Server running on Linux containers, on machine learning demonstrations, on SQL running in public clouds that accelerate and optimize and save you time and money, and even on scenarios where we bring the power of Azure to your environment with Azure Arc. SQL Edge to Cloud, we believe SQL is everywhere you need it, and we hope you come along this journey with us. We look forward so much to spending more time with you, and with having said that, it might be a great opportunity to stop even right now a little bit earlier than we even planned. And how about an interview? Would you like to do a live, see a live interview here in stage of this conference? Have you ever seen anything like that? But Buck's going to be up here, so I don't know what's going to happen. But I'm going to transition to come down out front here. I think we'll do a little interview with the Learn team. Let's go do it. <laughs> 